Hi all! So today I'm going to talk to you about pangolins! Uh, for anyone who hasn't met me before, uh, hi! My name is Arcantail, and I'm a fox-pangolin hybrid. And pangolins, to give you a brief introduction, are not only one of my absolute favourite creatures in the world, which is probably obvious, but also one of the weirdest. They are mammals that are absolutely covered in scaly articulated plates, and they are the only known creature of this type in the world. I also have one in my book series. His name is Atlas. They are also, very, very sadly, the most trafficked animal in the world, and I'll tell you a little bit why later on. For folks who do already know me and my pangolin devotion, all of these facts are ones I've read out on my streams during the Redeems and on um, World Pangolin Day, which is always the third Saturday in February, when I do a charity stream in aid of Pangolin Crisis Fund for these amazing lovelies. So some of you may already know these things, but we'll start at the beginning for anyone new to these wonderful tactical pine cones. Pangolins are often called scaly anteaters for their diets of ants and termites. They generally weigh anywhere between 4.4 and 7 pounds. Male pangolins are typically larger than females by about 40%. But there's very little data available for how long they're supposed to live. They're estimated they can live up to 20 years. Depending on the species, pangolins can vary in size from 30 to 152 centimeters long. That's roughly 12 to 60 inches for anyone who is not in the metric system. So the word pangolin comes from the Malay word penguling, meaning one who rolls up, or to roll, or rolling, named much like a pill bug or a roly-poly. Their scales are made of keratin, the same hard protein that makes up hair, nails, claws, hooves, feathers, and horns. They account for about 20% of the creature's total weight. A lot of their body mass is just scales. And pangolin scales are unique in that the layers of keratin are stacked in different orientations uh, to create a, a, cross, a criss cross structure. The way they're orientated and interlocked when the pangolin curls up for defense means they provide high stiffness and strength against fast impacts, but also have the ability to absorb energy when strain is applied more slowly. It also prevents cracks from propagating if they're pierced. And their scales, while protective, are also very effective at cutting and serration. They can lash their tails out to attack aggressors, and the edges of their scales can injure predators trying to dig or bite into their shell. There are eight species of pangolin, four African and four Asian. The four African species are the black-bellied pangolin, the white-bellied pangolin, the giant ground pangolin, and Temminx ground pangolin. The four Asian species are the Indian pangolin, Philippine pangolin, Sunda pangolin, and the Chinese pangolin. This, this image you see here is, has come from Peppermint Narwhal Creative, who sells pins and artwork of various endangered species in order to raise money and awareness for the creatures they depict. So please go and check them out, by the way. They're at www.peppermintnarwhal.com, and I'll put the link in the description below so you can check them out. And these various pangolins are split into three genuses, Manis, Fatagenus, and Smutsia. Smutsia covers the African ground pangolins, Fatagenus is the African tree pangolin species, and Manus is the four Asiatic species. Pangolins can extend their tongues up to 40 centimeters, depending on their size, and are about half an inch wide. Their tongues are rooted in their thorax, somewhere between their sternum and their trachea. Some pangolin tongues are longer than their entire bodies. They have five toes on their hind feet and three claws on each forelimb, they are nocturnal creatures and live in burrows or hollowed out trees, which they either dig out themselves with their intense digging skill and power, or move into empty ones already dug out by another creature. The burrows can extend as far as 11 feet deep. And some pangolins, Indian pangolins have been known to do this, are strong enough, they're strong enough diggers that they've been known to break through concrete to look for food. I have two sometimes. Just get the need. Anyway. Their tongues are sticky, which helps them collect insects as they bury into termite mounds. They also have special muscles in their mouths that prevent tasty creatures from escaping after ingestion. Pangolins can also completely close their nostrils and ears when feeding to prevent ants from crawling inside. But pangolins don't have teeth. While foraging, they ingest small stones which help grind up the ants or termites they eat. These are stored in a gizzard, which is also lined with keratinous scales, and these help smush the insects into a digestible form. Even though they are called scaled anteaters, taxonomically and genetically, 
they're actually a closer relative to the carnivora family, so cats, hyenas, dogs, etc., than Xenatha, which is a uh, family which includes sloths and actual anteaters. So, as far as my Fasona hybrid you see before you, it's not as unlikely a pairing as you think. Ah, soon, maybe. Pangolins are solitary creatures, but when they mate, a parent will raise a child for about two years. They meet at night by a watering hole to mate, typically once a year. Um, they don't have a defined mating season as such, but it usually happens around autumn or winter, which is the best weather for snuggling in my opinion. Rather than the males seeking out females for breeding, males mark their location with various forms of bodily waste, and the females come to find them. If competition occurs, the males use their tails as clubs to fight with the opportunity to reproduce. African pangolin species only tend to give birth to a single pup per pregnancy, while Asian pangolins can have up to three. Gestation can be anywhere from 70 to 140 days, about 10 to 20 weeks, to brew a pangolin. <laughs> pangolin pups are born with soft white scales, which harden and grow over the first few days. Uh, during this vulnerable stage, the mother pangolin will stay with them in the burrow, nursing and breastfeeding them and curling around them if they sense danger. The pups remain in the burrow for about two to four weeks after being born and will cling to their mother's tail as they move about. Where weaning takes about three months and they're often considered mature by the age of two, at which point the mother and offspring will usually separate. The pup is normally abandoned by the mother, uh, which proves to me even more that pangolins are a queer icon that must be protected at all costs. Um, but looking at this in terms of numbers, this means having one pup and raising them for two years before the parent becomes sexually active again means the population isn't replenished at the massive rate at which they're trafficked, which is one of the many, many reasons why they're so dangerously vulnerable. So why don't you see them in zoos? Well, pangolins don't fare well in captivity due to their very specific dietary needs, and over 70% of them die within a year. As well as them being very delicate, ironically, they're also fussy eaters. Even when a lot of insect varieties are available, they tend to stick to only one or two. So they're both queer and neurodivergent in case you needed a reason to love them anymore. The pangolin's taxonomical order, Philodota, comes from the ancient Greek word philiotodosh, meaning clad in scales. Other than humans, pangolin's natural predators tend to be hyenas and leopards, but they can also come up against lions, like these. Pangolins can swim. I can't. That's a trait I did not inherit from them. <laughs> Their front hooked claws make them very effective in water. Maybe I should try that. And I know everyone loves memes like these. <laughs> And it's led a few people to ask me whether pangolins are actually bipedal or not. And the answer is technically not completely. They do exhibit bipedal stances for some behaviours, and they walk about three miles an hour. Pangolins consume five to seven ounces of insects per day. So quite a lot more than those urban legends that insist you eat five spiders a year in your sleep. Spoiler warning, you do not. Travis the nocturnal spider devourer who consumes 172 spiders a night was an outlier and should not have been counted. Pangolins have very poor vision and tend to rely on their hearing and excellent sense of smell to find food. Not only this, <laughs> pangolins can release a foul defensive odour to protect themselves and mark territory and predators, much like a skunk. I guess having an amazing sense of smell probably has a drawback in that regard, but who knows. Maybe you get used to your own musk, or whatever you call it, defensive spray. Anyway. There were more species of pangolin that existed in history and prehistory. Those have already become extinct. One of these is known as Aomanis, the dawn pangolin, which to me is the coolest of names. Uh, Aomanis lived about 56 to 33 million years ago in Europe. Fossils uh, were found in the Messel pit in Germany, and given its size and skeleton, very little of pangolins has changed over the ages. They're not quite into the definition of a living fossil, um, because there isn't anything that is quite as uh, much a facsimile as what existed in the fossil record now. But according to the stomach contents of what was found in these fossils, um, it appeared to have a diet of both insects and plants. And another extinct family of pangolins is known as Patriomanidae, 
which means fathers of pangolins, which is super nice and distinguished for an ancestor to be called. These lived mostly in North America about the same time as Aomanis, and most of these specimens have been found in Montana. These were thought to have been arboreal, so living in trees much like the uh, white and uh, black belly pangolins. Um, they had a prehensile tail, could open its jaw wider than modern pangolins, and both its ears and the hair between its scales were longer than the pangolins you see today. So they may have looked a little bit more like pangolin foxes. Ooh -ooh. Now, before I tell you about the last species of extinct pangolin, we've already had two very cool names, but this last one is just, well... Necromanis. Literally meaning dead pangolin. I mean, seriously? You had Dawn and Father of Pangolins, both of which are really heckin' cool, and you just looked as th and you just looked at this as if someone asked, hey, what's this? I don't know, dead pangolin, and just ran with that? Everything extinct is already dead. Live fossils aren't a thing. You didn't call dinosaurs deadosaurs, did you? All pangolins are gonna be bloody necromanis if we're not careful, for goodness sake. Not exactly good for your self-esteem when one of your ancestors is explicitly called you, but dead. Anyway, <laughs> Necromanus has been discovered in fossil sites in France. All of the various ancient European pangolins have since fallen extinct. The last one perhaps only as recently as one to two million years ago, which is most closely related to the giant pangolins of Africa. The bones of these have been found in Romania. The biggest extinct pangolin is the giant Asian pangolin, an almost complete fossil that was found estimated the creature to have been about two and a half meters long. Pretty big. The bones for this fossil uh, were estimated to be about 42 to 47,000 years old. So we're about to get into the heavier facts about pangolin poaching, which will contain descriptions of why they're hunted and what parts of them are used. I am not going to have any imagery of dead pangolins in this video, but if you are sensitive to stories of animal harm, please listen or watch with caution and grab a pillow or a friendly creature to hug if needs be. The primary threat to most pangolins is illegal hunting and trade. Predominantly this is for their meat and scales, which have widely been used in various forms of traditional medicine. Largely, and absolutely falsely, they're believed to help with almost anything. They're sold almost as a snake oil ingredient to many different kinds of medicine, but given that they are just keratin, you might as well just be chewing your nails or eating your hair. They have such a variety of ludicrously and categorically falsely claimed medicinal or special powers, such as removing bad luck, chasing away demons, enabling invisibility, but there is no scientific evidence whatsoever for any medicinal benefit of pangolin scales, and I certainly don't know anyone who's become invisible from eating their fingernails. It's estimated that about a million pangolins have been illegally hunted and poached in the last decade, hence the reasons to raise awareness about them as creatures, their plight, and the need for intense conservation efforts as urgently as possible. Every single pangolin species is endangered to varying degrees. Three are listed as critically endangered. These are the Philippine pangolin, the Chinese pangolin, and the Sunda pangolin. China, Vietnam, and other Asian countries are the highest illegal trade destination for pangolins, as they are considered a delicacy there. The high price and perceived rarity means consumers eat pangolins as a luxury product to demonstrate their wealth and reinforce social status, such as business folk trying to impress people into signing a contract. In Africa, pangolins are poached mostly for domestic trade and as a food source. Um, estimates suggest that up to 400,000 pangolins are hunted every year for their consumption. Pangolin leather, as in leather made from the skin of the pangolin, is also sought and illegally imported into places like the USA, with it being predominantly in accessories like boots, belts and bags. In July 2020, it was widely reported that China increased protection for the native Chinese pangolin to the highest level and decreed that it would no longer allow the use of pangolin scales in traditional medicine. An estimated 195,000 pangolins were trafficked in 2019 for their scales alone. However, despite them being banned as a raw ingredient, they are still listed as a sub-ingredient in several patented medicines, so the ban is neither total nor complete. This happened before with animal parts like leopard bone and bear bile. 
even now there are still eight medicines containing pangolin scales listed in the Chinese Pharmacopoeia, a book for traditional Chinese medicine practitioners, that can legally be sold in China, and an additional 72 products containing them that are still legally available for sale in China. China allegedly has government-held stockpiles of pangolin scales which can be legally used at approximately 700 licensed hospitals to produce about 70 patented medicines, according to Traffic, which is a non-governmental organisation that monitors illegal animal trade. Between 2008 to 2015, about 26.6 tonnes of pangolin scales were used every single year. Conservationists are worried that pangolin scales will be illegally launched into these stockpiles if the system isn't properly managed. The China Biodiversity Conservation and Green Development Foundation stated that there is currently no legal procedure to stop the production of these patented medicines, which are owned and protected by various companies, and that the Chinese government has done its best to remove pangolins from TCM, traditional Chinese medicine. Take of that what you will. But as well as poaching, loss of habitat, use of pesticides and other human influences such as electric fences around farmland are also causing threats to pangolin numbers. Pesticides obviously kill their food source, loss of habitat leads to lack of shelter or safety, and human influence creates unsafe conditions for them to exist in, like roads, pits, fences, machinery, things like that. Now, in the, um, during the pandemic, Pangolins had been considered as a possible disease vector for COVID-19. This was found to be as a result of inaccurate testing and has since been denounced as false. Slightly better news though, Taiwan has the highest population density of pangolins in the world and is considered one of the few conservation grounds for them after introducing the 1989 Wildlife Conservation Act. Wildlife rehabilitation centers in places like, I'm probably going to pronounce these wrong, Luan Shan and Julian work with local Aboriginal tribes and forest police in the National Police Agency to prevent pangolin poaching and smuggling, especially to black markets in China. These centres have also helped to reveal the causes of death and injury among Taiwan's pangolin population and helped improve their overall health and environment. In a final, more hopeful segment of this video, I want to tell you about the Pangolin Crisis Fund, which is the charity I raise money for every year on World Pangolin Day. It launched in 2019 to fund projects designed to save pangolins. They invest in initiatives which aim to reduce demand for pangolin meat and scales, aid enforcement agencies such as customs, anti-poaching authorities, and protected area management. Um, they aim to combat trafficking, including judicial reform and anti-trafficking tools, developing those for local communities, promote public education and awareness of the creatures and the need for protection, engage the community to get them involved with uh, protection and awareness, they also conduct conservation planning with local governments and municipalities to protect all wildlife in the areas affected, not only pangolins, but everything else that is affected by these things. They have different programs such as rescue and rehabilitation, pangolin reintroduction, law enforcement review and mentoring, closing loopholes in international law, all of these and many, many more across the entire scope of pangolin habitats in Africa and Asia. The Pangolin Crisis Fund maintains a 100% donation model, so every dollar raised is directly deployed to projects that protect pangolins with zero administrative fees or overhead. The Pangolin Crisis Fund is part of the Wildlife Conservation Network, which has a four-star charity rating, so your donation truly, sincerely matters and makes a difference. Now, as well as the Pangolin Crisis Fund, there are other pangolin charities and conservation efforts you can donate to as well. The Pangolin Specialist Group at www.pangolinsg.org bornfree.org.uk, which has specific conservation programs, the David Shepherd Wildlife Foundation at davidshepherd.org slash pangolins, which offers you the chance to donate to their cause or adopt a pangolin. In the sense of financial or sponsorship, you, you do not get to take one home. Savepangolins.org not only supports Pangolin Crisis Fund, but also runs the Pangolin Champion Program, supporting individual conservationists who are emerging leaders in pangolin conservation, and they also give innovation grants to support key projects that offer creative, targeted solutions to pangolin protection and advocacy. The links for all those are put below. I hope this has been interesting. I absolutely adore these creatures and I get excited anytime anyone shares a GIF or article, photo, video, character design with me. Um, if you have a pangolin character, I already love them. Um, spreading awareness of their existence and danger helps so much in helping change minds and drive change in the hope that they'll be able to repopulate. 
helping conservation and anti-trafficking efforts is only beneficial to other kinds of animal by proxy to us as well. Um, so yes, love pangolins, save pangolins, learn about pangolins, and embrace pangolins. Hold gentle like a burger. <laughs> anyway, be safe, take care, have fun, and I will see you soon. Oh, I can click. I didn't know I could click. They also have special muscles in their mouth that pretend... <laughs> oh no. It's all gone wrong. Ugh. I drank too much. My cranberry juice. Why are you filming me now? Which helps them collect insects on them, is it? Which helps... <laughs> ah! Wrong window. Ah! My leap motion crawling across my desk. <clears throat> Stop that. Why, why you do this to me? Why? I've been nothing but kind to you.